Well, hello, and welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we usually journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. But today, Phil and I are joined by Dr. Crystal Hurd, who is the author of the new book, The Leadership of C.S. Lewis, 10 Traits to Encourage Change and Growth. Uh, Crystal, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so fun to welcome you back. It's great to catch up. It's been a while since we've gotten to talk to you and see you. Um, a lot has changed in the last two years, and so it's. But one thing that has not changed is the genius of C.S. Lewis. So that's exactly exciting to have a conversation <laughs> about that. Well, just I, obviously, you were back on the show uh, in season three, I believe, right there at the end of season three as we covered The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And we talked a little bit about some of the work you've done as an academic and as a writer. But can you just kind of catch us up to speed on anything new that you've been up to or just kind of remind some of our listeners who may have forgotten um, what exactly it is that you do and why you were such a great, you don't have to brag about yourself if you don't want to, but why you are such a great uh, leader in this field of C.S. Lewis. Oh, thanks again uh, for having me. I, I always always delighted to join you all. Um, yeah, so um, in 2012, I graduated with my doctorate in uh, educational leadership and wrote um, on C.S. Lewis as a transformational leader. Um, and that's what is blossomed into the book that that just came out in April. Um, so uh, besides that work, I've done some work on C.S. Lewis and gender. Um, I wrote a chapter on Flora Lewis, which is uh, C.S. Lewis's mother, uh, for the book Women and C.S. Lewis back in 2015. And um, I've also done some work uh, sort of piggybacking off of that on the Lewis family. So I'm working on a book now called Bookish Clever People, uh, which will sort of explore Lewis's genetics on both sides of his mm-hmm. family um, and sort of see the um, spiritual and literary influences that shaped him uh, into the apologist, writer, thinker that he became. Um, so I've done a, quite a bit of work on that. I do have a website. It doesn't, I don't, I don't um, <laughs> update it super often because uh, I stay pretty busy. Like you, I'm an, I'm an educator. Um, I teach dual enrollment, uh, British literature and composition and mm-hmm. creative writing and a lot of fun stuff. So um, when I'm not doing that, I'm usually asleep um, or... <laughs> <laughs> That's what every teacher says, especially yeah. this year. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I love to write. I love, I love to write poetry and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's just um, the, the, the life of, of the word, you know, it's, it's really neat. So yeah. Um, and, and with all these things, Crystal, you are really a leading expert in these very specific fields on Lewis, whether it be Lewis and gender or Lewis and leadership or even Lewis's parents, which there really is not, I mean, I think that there's been a growing, uh, thankfully, there's been a growing interest in the people connected to Lewis, whether that be Warney or Joy, but you've really led the way in studying his parents, um, which is really great because it even makes it into your book on leadership. And can you tell us about, I know you're working on on a little bit of work. Are you allowed to tell us just a little bit about that right now? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 I've, uh, yeah, I've published, uh, last year I published an article in Christian history mm-hmm. um, on the parents. And um, yeah, I mean, they were um, just very fascinating people. Um, his mother is one of the first women to achieve a degree from uh, what is now Queens University. It was uh, it had its own women's academy mm-hmm. back then. But um, Flora Lewis was uh, Flora Hamilton, as she was known at the time, uh, was um, she had had she scored firsts and seconds in logic and geometry and mathematics and algebra. Mm-hmm. And she was a I mean, one of the books that I read on. Queen set, uh, called her a trailblazer. Um, she was the reason why her and a, and a few other women were the reason why uh, people approached Queens in the late 1880s to allow women to study. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, there, which was so you can imagine, you know, having a mother like that um, uh, teaching and she would teach them languages. Um, you know, she actually spent some time in Italy as a young girl um, <clears throat> and was was close to a village called Narni. Um, which ah, some people have, yeah. <laughs> have have said maybe was yeah the the you know one of the influences for that. But you know his father has gotten a lot of bad rap in a lot of biographies over the years, and Lewis is also um, guilty of that in Surprised by Joy. He he 
he does paint him with a with a with a little bit of a tainted brush. <laughs> but um, actually, if we do, if you look at some of the things that Albert did, he was a community leader, um, and he would do a lot of um, he would do a lot of work with the poor mm-hmm. and the destitute in Belfast. Um, and would actually fight for them in a system that he felt privileged the aristocrats and the rich. Mm-hmm. Um, so he did a lot of great community work in his life, which was why he was so busy, which is why everybody, you know, <laughs> yeah, he gets painted with, yeah, he gets painted with this brush of being a, a, a kind of an absent father, right? Yeah. Because a workaholic. Yeah, exactly. That, that might be a better way to yeah. say and it. And there so. was, a, there was a reason why, but, you know, going back into the Lewis papers last year, I went to the Wade on a, the Kilby grant and did some mm-hmm. research and like, he was so good at his job that people would volunteer him for all these jobs wow. and like, there was there was one situation where somebody retired and they said well really this job should be two people but then they just let albert do all of it <laughs> <laughs> there's like any anywhere you go i feel like especially in education i just there's, there's always that person somewhere who's like regularly voluntold just to do things and uh, it's it's interesting to know that that goes all the way back at least just to the uh the the 19th century maybe i'm sure much further than that so <laughs> yeah they were great uh, i mean just so wonderful people reading mm-hmm. all this stuff they were just what a great way to grow up i mean he had a he had a really rich imagination which was fertile soil anyway yeah. um but he had two great parents who were really pushing him and and you know i mean albert is nothing but you know, exceptionally supportive of yeah. Lewis. I mean, he gave, I mean, literally there's, there's a whole lot in Belfast about how much money he gave to his two sons. Mm. Like, mm. Um, you know, he gave a lot um, of money and supported them far long after he probably should have. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> but you know, he, he, they had a great upbringing. So it's really cool to look at, you know, all these, um, all these sort of connections. And um, there's even, a, I'll go ahead and tell you this. There's even a, a section in one of the, uh, Um, Lewis papers where they're talking about grandfather Lewis this is uh, Albert's dad who carved the wardrobe that is now at the Wade Mm -hmm. Center that was in the house Um, uh, he actually lived with them for a little while um, and they said he used to take his cane and nick off the tops of like weeds and flowers and stuff Um, and that's the same image you see in the screw tape letters Right. When they're talking, when they're talking, when they're talking about uh, dictators that would ride by the fields and knock everything down. So everybody's the same. Um, That image is actually in the screw tape letters. Hmm. Oh, that's so cool. And yeah, it's so fun to hear like where the inspiration for this. You mentioned the Narni part and Mm -hmm. then even that little detail. Yeah. So um, before we talk a little bit or hear from you about the book, I just wanted to share, and you know, I've already told you this back in the green room, you know, before we started recording, but um, I cannot recommend this book enough to our listeners. The book that you've written, you know, you mentioned a little bit about his parents in it, but it's, it's like you said, it's, it's more focused on Lewis as a leader and kind of you, you take these 10 traits and you talk, you you look at Lewis through kind of the lens of these traits, and then you look at these traits through the lens of Lewis, kind of back and forth. And you know, I obviously am really interested in this field uh, as a reader myself, just because it kind of it takes my passion and my you know kind of personal hobbies of, of Lewis and lines them up a little bit more with some of my professional things as someone who's getting a, a degree in educational leadership right now. And kind of I I felt very special as you uh, as kind of some of the name drops. I was you know looking over to my wife on the other couch like oh oh I, I know this person I, I've read I read some of his work or some of her work um, while also being like and I know the person who wrote this book which is so fun. Um, but outside of that, I think for even for any of our listeners who obviously they know C.S. Lewis listening to this podcast, but maybe who don't know a lot about leadership, I think your book has a lot to say about what a leader is, and especially modern ideas of leaders. We'll get into this in a few minutes when we talk about transformational leadership. But this, you know, I, I think if you if we were having this conversation a hundred years ago, I don't know that we would think of Lewis as a leader. You have much more of like a great man theory. And and while Lewis is a great man in, in many respects, like he, he's not the kind of person who kind of just demands your attention when he gets up. I think one of the reasons this book is so timely and so 
interesting to read right now is because it really looks at Lewis, a man who hated things like chronological snobbery or honestly just a lot of modern ideas. It actually takes a somewhat modern idea like transform- transformational leadership and kind of shows that there there are some really great things that we can learn from that. And so um, I think for any of our listeners who even have not, you know, who are not interested maybe in leadership theory, they might inter- be interested in, in any of these 10 traits of uh, that make for a good leader and how that relates to someone like Lewis, who did not hold kind of a traditional position of leadership. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, when I actually, I mean, of course, a lot of people ask me where the, where the, where the ideas came from, and it mm-hmm. was exactly what you said, which was, you know, I was in an ed leadership program and I needed a dissertation <laughs> topic and I loved Lewis and I wanted an excuse to read Lewis. So I just mm-hmm. married the two <laughs> and said, I want to write about C.S. Lewis as a leader. And um, as I was studying transformational leadership, I just kept coming back to the fact that like he he was an authentic leader. He, mm-hmm. he wasn't an he wasn't an intentional leader. Um, and I think I, I talk at the beginning of the book about how he he really felt when he was young that he was not leadership material at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, but that's sort of the beauty of Christ when when you, in an obedience because he became, you know, um, a figure in apologetics and especially after you know the broadcasts, um, he sort of became a you know a, a armchair theologian or whatever that some people say and yeah um he became a leader um just by simply doing what he felt he was supposed to do um and and just unintentionally sort of embodied all these traits um that make for great leaders yeah right i feel like he was kind of a connecting point for the lay person to the theologians by existing in both worlds i guess you could say yeah which is tough to do to have a have to sort of straddle that boundary <laughs> right but i think yeah. he did i think he's one of the few individuals i've ever read that can do that um yeah. you know like chesterton or you know just like just some of these people who are just so incredibly wise and, and mm-hmm. intelligent um and advocates for the kingdom um mm-hmm. so they sort of bridge that divide yeah definitely well yeah speaking of um, two worlds and bridging that divide uh, we wanted to connect this to Narnia a little bit. And in this book, you list 10 different traits that encourage growth. Do you think there's any one in particular that's the most prominent in the Chronicles of Narnia? So I'm going to cheat and say two. Okay. <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think uh, humility is important um, in leadership development in Narnia. Um, Prince Caspian I love that scene. And I mentioned it in the book where Prince Caspian says, do you think I'm ready to be a leader? And Aslan says, because you have asked me that it proves that you are, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're, cause you're not haughty, you're arrogant. Um, you're not too confident. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and that's like, I love that scene because, and then, then when we see him later, right. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because Prince Caspian, you know, when they come back, later on right Mm -hmm. in don treader he's a king caspian right but then here are these former kings and queens that have come back into that time and then there's that there's that one scene where there's actually kind of some infighting between you know caspian and edmund Edmund, right it's like ah how many chiefs do we need here right um so it's I, i think and it's so cool the way lewis does that because he's he is making some you know, he's is making some assertions about how leadership works and, you know, working in a group. I think that's really important. Um, you know, if you've, if people who've read it know that when um, the care, there's always like a male and female character usually mm-hmm. in these stories um, and they are working out problems together. Um, there's, yeah, there's all, there's always this, uh, you know, there's always this conversation. What do you think we should do? Right. And and so it's almost it's sort of diplomatic in the way that it works. Um, So even with that, it's like it's like he's teaching little kids, you know, this is how you live in a society with other people. And this is how you treat other people. And this is how we can work together to get a common goal done is then we work and we get everybody involved and get we get everybody on board. Because when we when it doesn't happen, like, for example, um, in the magician's nephew, right, when 
uh, when Polly's like, well, I'm leaving. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> well, I'm leaving. I can't do this. I, and then, you know, and then, and then the Diggory rings the bell and then pretty much the whole story shifts from that point, that bell echoes through all the rest of the books. Right. Because that, that one catalyst, that one act is a catalyst for everything that happens later. So, and I think in that, in that way, he's showing us about the importance of decision-making and understanding Mm -hmm. um, the consequences of the things we do and say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's, that's a really good thing to think through. I know that's uh, I'm just processing it as you, you tell us about that. I think we see so much and we're going to get into this because we're also going to talk to you um, soon uh, with chapter four, as you just alluded to with that bell and the hammer with the magician's nephew. And it makes me, I'm trying not to get too far into it because we don't obviously spoil Phil, you and I here. It's really interesting too, because uh, you know, hitting on gender, I've always, you know, I've met people who say, well, you know, Jadis was a woman and she was a witch. And I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. King Moraz was a guy and he was terrible. I mean, you know, corruption is has no gender, <laughs> right. you know, um, that, you know, these are, he's really showing us how humans and children can be corrupted by power and, and, you know, all those things. And, and so I, I love, I love that Lewis focuses on that. I think it's very, um, in, in the stories, it's, 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 it's nuanced a little more, mm-hmm. but every time we have that conversation with people and they're trying to make a decision, which happens a lot in these books, um, it's sort of teaching you how to negotiate and compromise and working through those things so that yeah. you can have the best of the, of, for everyone, what's the best for everyone. And That's I think cool. Aslan, Aslan is the empowering force, you know, he's like, he's present in every book. He's the only character that we see in every single book, mm-hmm. but he's not always powering through to save the day. A lot of times he comes in and empowers other people sure. to do those things. And that's really what a transformational leader does. I love that. Yeah. I also love how Aslan will, he doesn't force people to do stuff, but he makes it very clear what the right thing to do is. And, but it gives them the space that they need to kind yeah. of come to him in that way. Um, and that's actually one of the questions that we have here too, is you talk about the importance of inspiring others as opposed to forcing compliance. And how do you think Lewis did this as a leader? Oh, as a person. Well, I think he was, he was a genuine Christian. <laughs> um, that's sort of a short answer, but um, yeah. I, I firmly believe that um you know, God is the engineer of the human and he created us in a certain way to work best in, you know, these being kind to each other and don't kill and don't steal and, don't, you know, and all these things. And I feel like the Bible actually is, if you, especially if you read um, the New Testament with a leadership lens and the Old Testament too, um, you really see uh, the importance of how God's word is also very, uh, very poignant in leadership training. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, being receptive, being kind, being compassionate, um, you know, all these things. So while Lewis was not an intentional leader, because he was practicing those things, um, he was getting his leadership principles from the Bible. Um, and that's how he sort of became a leader just naturally. Um, because, you know, and I think one of the things that we all love about Lewis, um, is like, is his authenticity and the, and the fact that he lived what he believed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just going to say, Crystal, do you think that makes it in, you know, to Narnia at all as well, or any of his other fiction? When you, Do you see that anywhere in his, in his fiction stories? Um, yeah. Um, I think in, for the ransom, the ransom trilogy, for yeah, example, yeah. Um, you know, I think book three, um, what's really cool about Elwin Ransom is that when we meet him, you know, he basically gets, you know, professor napped or whatever. And he's uh-huh, exactly, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> by the time we get to um, that hideous strength, mm-hmm. he's, he's the, he has, he's the director, right? So he's actually, Correct. he actually has a leadership position in at St. Anne's, but um, there's a whole conversation in there about who does the work in the house, how the stuff is divided, why they divided it that way. <laughs> Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so even even as Ransom is the director at St. Anne's, he does the same thing that we talked about Aslan doing, which is giving people space, right? Like Jane, to kind of mm-hmm. figure out, 
oh, okay, this is what's happening and this is what I need to do. And this is the, the gift I have. And so, you know, she, she has the gift of being, you know, of having visions, right? Of, yeah, so, of seeing the future and everything. Yeah. Right. And so he, he kind of gives her the space, but the inspiration to develop that without being pushy or, mm -hmm. you know, pushing her into one direction or another. He gives her the space to decide. Um, oh, and that to me yeah. is a leader. I love that. Well, you know, as we've had this conversation, we've mentioned multiple times this idea of transformational leadership, you know, as this, but the, transformational leadership is this relatively new idea. I mean, it wasn't even coined by, by uh, James McGregor Burns until after Lewis was uh, dead. And so, um, and so can you maybe explain to us what exactly this type of leadership is and how Lewis is transformational? You've touched on that a little bit, but maybe just more specifically. So um, transformational leadership is technically defined as an approach that causes change in individuals and social systems as it, you know, through the individuals. Mm -hmm. um, in its ideal form, it creates valuable and positive change in followers. And the goal of a transformational leader is to create leaders. So not to, uh, not to, you know, like make a leader a deity or, <laughs> mm -hmm. or just get compliance from others. Right. Yeah, um, it's, that. it's, it's a flow. It's a back and forth, you know, flow. It's a, it's, um, now what you were mentioning a second ago, Phil, was about, you know, compliance. That's, that's more transactional leadership, you know, which is, um, I'll do this job for you and you'll give me a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, you know, period, full stop. Um, uh, transformational leadership is so goes so much deeper. It's really about having rapport and understanding people. And because you show that empathy and compassion to people, they're more willing to follow you mm. um, because you, you know, you've shown that the, you understand them. Um, that can't be understated in leadership. It's very important. Um, people don't want, you know, um, disassociative leaders. They, yeah. they don't, they're not, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not for that. So um, transformational leadership, what I love about it is it talks about motivation, but also morale and morals mm -hmm. of the followers. So there is sort of a, a morality aspect to that. So there's four, um, there's four sections to transformational leadership. One is individualized consideration, which is attending to each person's needs um, and acknowledging what mm -hmm. they need and being receptive. Uh, the second one's intellectual stimulation. Um, you know, you've got to be, you know, intelligent to sort of understand the situation you're in and, you know, try to come up with solutions that will best benefit everyone. Um, inspirational motivation, which is um, I, you're appealing to me, you're inspiring me, I want to follow you. I think that's just, you know, I think that's just human nature, uh, right? And Lewis even says in, um, he says in um, Mere Christianity um, that our desire to, to, you know, to follow people is innate. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we don't have spiritual people to follow, uh, we will follow athletes and actors, right? He says, uh, he calls it poison, right? Mm -hmm. um, he says it will gobble poison um, if it doesn't have spiritual food. So, um, and then, right. so we set up all these really, uh, terrible people, <laughs> as, you know, as, yeah. as, as these leaders, because we, we are innately designed to, you know, want to follow someone. It's kind of the whole David Foster Wallace of like, we're all created to worship something, you know? I mean, he's a, he's someone who's a, like, a, you know, a very adamant atheist kind of saying a very similar thing that us as Christians are like, oh no, we agree, we agree with you, you know, exactly. And, you and know. then we're surprised when the leaders that we've chosen, the, the sports people and the the actors when they let us down or they make a a gap or a mistake or something yeah, yeah and it's not that christian leaders don't make mistakes it's just well, I mean, what do you look like where is your source of morality mm -hmm. right and i think for christian leaders the bar is higher i mean um you know um because there are people who are looking to you mm -hmm. um you know one of the things in conversations with my students in a secular public school um is the kids have told me, you know, I don't, I believe in God, but I don't want to go to church because I don't want to, I don't want to associate with 
uh, people who say one thing and do another. Mm-hmm. Like I'm re- like, I really don't want that. Like, um, and so for me, that was like, wow, these kids really want authenticity. They're not falling away from God. They're seeking him harder than ever and trying mm-hmm. to find him somewhere right. um, in a culture that, you know, does, you know, flip flops on like, you know, what it believes and what it says. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of rhetoric now with social media uh, that wasn't around when I was that age, but mm-hmm. um, <laughs> X amount of years ago, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's um, because it is so prominent. The kids want, you know, young people, I think Gen X, I I actually heard this the other day, um, for every young person that joins the church, four leave. Wow. Um, And that is a recent, um, that's a recent statistic. And, um, and there's been a lot of, you've probably seen some of the research by the Barna group that echoes Mm -hmm. the same thing. I mean, I think it's somewhere close to 80% of Christians believe there is a leadership crisis in the church. Yeah. I mean. I yeah. think just recently, obviously this will air, you know, uh, a little bit after we record it, but just uh, this week was the big SBC report of, of abuse in, in the church. And there was a, a really great, I mean, really sad, but well-written uh, article. I think it was in the Atlantic or the New Yorker, New Yorker, kind of like, you know, uh, no like atheist has done this much damage to the church as Christian leaders, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't many great, faithful, humble leaders who protect, you know, the people in their congregations that really do, you know, stand up against abuse or against other things. But unfortunately, it's there's there are times when we have seen across many different denominations uh, of church, whether it be Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, where you've seen people in positions of leadership, even if they're not the ones making these terrible uh, mistakes or doing these horrific things, they're the ones maybe covering it up for the sake of the system or the body, right? And that's the kind of stuff that, like, it, that's it, it is transformational leadership in like the worst possible way. Like, it is transforming people, but only transforming them far away from. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Pseudo transformational leadership. So it's absolutely. Well, that's another thing. Um, when Phil was asking me, you know, which ones are in Narnia, I think the other one is courage. Mm-hmm. Um, courage. You you have to be able to stand up and say, no, this does not fly. <laughs> this you cannot do this. This is not. You know, and I've been and I'm I'm sure maybe some people or some of the listeners have been in a situation where you're you're in a church with you know working in a church and people say well this happened but we're not going to talk about that and you're like Mm -hmm. what you know you have to you know i've been in that situation where i was told like don't talk about that um don't mention that like we don't say that you know uh, about the leader you know and i I mean there was one point i I was at a church that i'm not i'm not at now but like um you know i said even on secular levels you know (laughs) this is not good and the person yeah. said, well, I know you've got a degree and everything, but you're just being critical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I am, because <laughs> yes. yeah, there are things here that are happening that are not correct. You know, and that uh, later on, that pastor ended up leaving yeah. um, over some stuff. And so, um, you know, I think light always chases darkness, but we've got to we've got to have the courage to walk in with the candle in the dark yeah. and say, this is, this can't happen. I mean, I think our, our innate sense of justice, I feel is God given. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and as, as somebody like, I, I never had any sort of experiences like that as a female in the church, uh, mm-hmm. but I know people who have. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know plenty of women who have. And so my heart goes out to them. And uh, this is not, this makes, this is not right. Jesus would not be cool with that. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, this makes the heart of God weep. Like we have to do better. And I think that's, as you mentioned, courage, I think, you know, just kind of looking at this, um, you know, very modern story, this very current story with things like the SBC. And again, it's not just the SBC. There's many, unfortunately, places where this is occurring. I think that's, we do see the courage in the women who have come forward or who have led these. And then, and also people like, uh, I think about someone like Russell Moore, who's been very, you know, um, in I think a lot of the evangelical world been kind of this, like, no, like, I'm not going to stand for this. You know, I don't, if you're going to throw my credentials back at me or you're going to say these things, like, I'm not going to stand for what is evil, you know? And, and that's the kind of courage we see from these type of people that is very Narnian, right? It's, and it's, 
in, in this kind of and having courage to both stand up to evil of this world, but also the the bad things we see in our own circle, like is in the our own in the church, kind of the capital C church itself. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from Narnia in that. Yeah, absolutely. One of my really good friends is uh, Karen Swallow Pryor, who oh um, yeah, yeah, really famous. Yeah, um, so I've I've been friends with her for several years. We met on Twitter, but I've been at Liberty when she was working there and, and okay. uh, hung out with her a little bit. And uh, you know, she get she used to get hate mail all the time. Yeah, uh, for just being an outspoken female in in uh, uh, yeah. in those situations, and I and I told her, and I even tagged her on you know on on social media. I said it takes a lot of bravery to do what you've mm-hmm. done, but thank you because you're saying what so many of us want to say. Yeah. Um, you know about about things and it takes courage and because you have that courage you're going to get a lot of slings and arrows of <laughs> misfortune thrown at yeah. you right you're gonna you're gonna get criticized but that's just par for the course um the bible is really clear on how we treat each other um yeah you know and 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 lewis talks about and i mentioned this too in, in the leadership book some but uh and it's all over it's all over the chronicles of narnia but i mean um we we know how to treat each other mm-hmm. that that we know how to be kind we know how to be compassionate and we know when we're not doing that um yeah. you know i mean i was thinking about uncle andrew uh the other day from 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 magician's nephew and how he's sure. such a snob you know yeah. <laughs> and how the rules the rules don't apply to him that poor guinea pig right um yeah. you know it's just uh you know he he doesn't want to do the work himself he just wants to take credit for it and sit back and let everybody else kind of t- yeah um yeah these you know these people and they're and, and lewis is framing them kind of as you know as more villain characters mm-hmm. not heroes the heroes are the kids who the brave kids right who go to the yeah. between the worlds they're the brave kids who step out and fight the white witch you know um that's that's well said well, that, that kindness and compassion part, the kindness part is so important because I think that everyone is craving that regardless of background, everyone, that's what re- people really want. And the approaches are different. And I think that's why it's so important for especially Christians to be kind and to lead in that way, because people are going to continue seeking kindness. And if they don't see it coming from the church, they're going to seek it out elsewhere. And they're also going to seek out different ways of maybe enforcing kindness or, you know, codifying that somehow, Mm -hmm. or you have to do it. Um, It's, yeah, it's crucial. And I think kindness too, it's part of the inspiration model of transformational leadership, right? Um, When you are kind to people, um, they, they naturally are drawn to you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was actually in the hallway yesterday. My, My husband and I both teach at the same school. Um, that he's a, he's a career and technical director. Um, but one of his students stopped me in the hall and said, I just want to thank you guys for everything you've done for me. I bless his heart. I haven't really done much for him. Just be nice to him. You know, all <laughs> year. You know, he's a nice kid. Um, and his father is, has not, he doesn't have a good relationship with his father. And he told me in the hallway, it was, I'm just about choking up. He said, your husband is a father figure to me. Mm-hmm. because he is so kind to me and he talks to me and he's interested in, you know, and we have conversations and he's like, he's, he's like a father figure to me. And I was like, what an amazing compliment, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that is the power. I think that God shows us right. in kindness and love. That's part of him that goes out into the world when we're kind to other people. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of that has to do with, I'm sure for your husband being, you know, very authentic and real, like that kindness has to be authentic, obviously. And, and you've mentioned a little bit about, um, being an authentic leader, this kind of this, you know, Bill George idea of, you know, finding your true North, right. And can you just maybe it's kind of a last question here, tell us a little bit about the idea of authentic leadership and then how Lewis, how, how you feel that Lewis was authentic in the way that he wrote and related to his writers. Oh, wow. Um, well, I thought, I, I think authentic leader is just walking the walk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's really, in a nutshell, what it is. It's like, there's there's a whole lot of, um, and I remember being a little kid and, and people saying, man, I hate politics. <laughs> like, I, like, I hate all this stuff. And, you know, now, and I was a kid, I'm like, why do all these people want to sit around and talk about politics all day? Uh, you know, now as an adult, I sort of see, you know, the complexity of like, of, you know, the government and policies and laws and stuff like that. And especially with a, a degree in policy, you know, it's, it, you, you have to learn to balance things when you're making policy, right. For schools or whatever, uh, in your leadership programs, you know, there's a lot of gray area 
that you have to navigate when you're mm-hmm. a leader. Um, and I think, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me once, but my, my dad is a great guy. He's a, he's been a welder for 40 years and, uh, you know, it's just a salt of the earth person. And, uh, somebody told me once, you know, he's the same in public as he is at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that is, that's a really great compliment for someone, uh, because, um, and, and my dad has a lot of people who respect him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's an elder in, in the church where I grew up and he has a lot of people who respect him because he is authentic because he mm-hmm. says what he believes and he, you know, he believes it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not persuaded by, you know, some fly by night group or whatever. It's um, it's because you're rooted in God's word. And that is the thing that guides you um, mm-hmm. is right. God's word. Um, and you know it and I know it. Right. I mean, we know we know these things. If you've grown up in church, I grew up in church. Um, you know, I was I was like one of the youth group in the 90s listening uh-huh. to DC, listening they to DC, DC talk. talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The newsboys. Sure, you know. sure. Um, <laughs> You're naming everything I checked out from the church library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I read that. Uh, what was that one book that all the kids read and um uh, there was like uh, there was one for men and one for women. I can't remember oh, sure. what it was, but like yeah, there was you know that um, purity culture and everything. I mean, I was that was a huge part of my adolescence, and uh, you know, um, we we've learned from an early age what is what God wants. You know, as far as our behavior, um, it seems just like sometimes we compromise on that for whatever reason, and authentic leaders don't compromise on that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, um, Lewis, um, I think the reason that Lewis was so good and, and because because he was um, he wasn't a snob. I talk about that in the book. You know, he yeah. was he grew up in working class shipyard, um, you know, early in his years before they moved to Little Lee. Um, you know, he grew up around the working class. Um, his dad was very fond of the working class. I mean, there was um, there's a great story about um, Albert kicking a guy out of his office like uh, screaming at the top of his lungs. You want me to use my knowledge to commit a scandal out with you. <laughs> mm, wow. I mean, yeah. I mean, he, he's, literally, he's literally kicking people out of um, it's something like that. You know, he's kicking yeah. people out of his office for saying, well, now you're a lawyer. So can we, you know, do this little legal thing. Right. And slot, you know, and, and he's like, absolutely not. I will not. Um, you know, Albert says, I will not, you know, pull back on my values. Yeah. And, and so, and that's the, the man that's C.S. Lewis's father, right? Uh, so yeah. there's a man who was, um, who saw that at home. He saw that authenticity at home and he knew that was the best way to live your life. And that was the godly way to live your life. Yeah. Um, to stick to those principles. Do yeah. you, do you think Crystal just kind of as a addendum here to, to that question that, what do you find to be, I mean, as you can talk personally, you can maybe think even kind of on a macro level from all of us as readers, what about C.S. Lewis's writing? Is it just the simple answer? And maybe I'm answering it for you, but we'll definitely let you talk, obviously. Uh, is it just the simple thing of like, he's authentic in his writing and that's why we we love him? Or is there anything more to, is it, is it, more, is it more complicated than that? Or is it just as basic as no, he's just an authentic guy? Um, I think his authentic personality um, spills onto the page. I, mm-hmm. I, I really think that that's, uh, that's an extension of him. I mean, one of the things, I don't know what Lewis book you first read, which, which, what was your fir- first Lewis book? I mean, as a kid, it probably was definitely Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. My first, my first Lewis book as an adult was Screw Tape Letters in like early high school. Yeah. Same, same here, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my first one was Mere Christianity. Okay. okay. That was, my, that was like my second one. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I like I said, I kind of grew up in a church where people didn't talk about the incon- the biblical inconsistencies. You know, sure, it's like, sure. uh, yeah, we didn't talk about that. I mean, um, and it was just like, don't don't question it, just accept it. And yeah. um, you know, my brain just couldn't do that. I was, you know, I I was I was horrible for my poor you know youth leaders. I'm like, well, wait, what about this? Yeah, that doesn't you know? make any sense. Uh, you <laughs> like, more. Wait. <laughs> you know this contradicts with this you know uh you know you know when i was learning and you know, growing up and learning stuff and so um lewis was the first person who gave me permission to kind of sit comfortably in the gray area mm-hmm. um and what i love about uh Barrett christianity is he comes right out of the gate you know and says you know 
um he he starts with that complaint by you know by the guy about, oh, about yeah, something. Yeah. And he's and he says, you know, we wouldn't even know what a straight line was if we if all we had was crooked lines. Mm-hmm. Uh and I was mm-hmm. just like, Yeah. Yeah, and I was I was like chewing on it. And mm-hmm. you know, the deeper you get into the book, it's all just like rational blending of faith and intellect. Mm-hmm. And I loved that because it was like finally, you know, I can it's okay to doubt, right? Because, yeah. you know, when you grow up and you have those doubts and I went through, I mean, all my schools are, uh, all my post-secondary stuff. I mean, all of it's public schools. Um, mm. so I went through se- all secular schools, you know? Um, and yeah, there's, there were points where I'm just like, mm, I don't know if this reckon, yeah, I can reconcile this with like what I learned growing up. Yeah. And, and there were times where I had to go through that process and came out on the other end, you know, but it made my faith stronger in the end. And then Lewis had that same experience, right? He was an atheist for a while and, and, and God pulled him back in <laughs> through George McDonald and, you know, Tolkien and all these great people. Um, so I felt, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the journey is sort of understanding and knowing, but, but that also lends you authenticity because you can say with certainty, yes, I've experienced this. Yes. I know what you're dealing with. Yes. I, I, I understand it, which is why le- people love Lewis so much. Cause he's, right. he's so attuned into the atheist mindset. Cause he had that, um, mm-hmm. you know, he, he experienced it. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I think that but he echoes us so well and he echoes what our hearts are saying so well. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that's what we love about him. You know, um, I love his writing style. I mean, there's just, you know, it's this perfect blend of like academic, but also imaginary, you know, like, uh, to me, it's just a beautiful, Yeah, it's just beautiful. So, um, you know, it's just, I, I, I think till we have faces, I was telling you guys earlier, that's my favorite novel ever period, <laughs> um, yeah. by Lewis. And I love that novel so much because when I went through that phase, I felt like, okay, now I have to face God. If I, if I really want to say, be a Christian, I gotta be a Christian. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'll lift the veil off and I'll, oh, yeah, yeah. and I'll say, is this what I really believe? Not because I had some sort of inherited spiritual experience, but because I felt you mm-hmm. because I felt you and you're in me and you're changing me and you're transforming me. And that is an authentic experience. And that's what I wanted. Um, you know, I can't, I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to. Somebody once told me that my name was Crystal because I'm so transparent. Nice. <laughs> I, I, I took it. I, mean, I was like, well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, but, it, you know, it's, you, I wanted to, you know, we want to be real. And I want to be real because my, you know, one of the guys I admire so much was just C.S. Lewis was real. Sure. He was, he was real. And, and he's inspiring me to be real um, and to live a real and authentic life because he did. Lewis didn't seem afraid to engage in, I mean, how, how often do we hear about, you know, this, these debates he would get into at Oxford and he would have these big publicized, uh, debates and it, it feels so authentic. Exactly. Just like you're saying, it doesn't feel like he's, well, I'm just trying to beat you just so I can prove to you that I'm right. It's like, I want to have this because we have a relationship and I, I want to talk through these things. Hmm. And I think all of that authenticity is what so many of us continue to feel, you know, formed by as as readers of his works. Right. And I think uh, the last two years, I think if anything have proven that we live in a culture that, you know, can be pretty divisive and really nasty to each other. And, and Lewis never, you know, so many people I've read a lot up on the, um, the Socratic club, but like Mm -hmm. he was never nasty or rude or mean to anyone who came up and, you know, presented, you know, presented a a different side to an issue. He was never like, I mean, if he was that way, he wouldn't have all these people, showing up every week <laughs> sure to, to listen to him talk yeah like i mean if, if you just want to sit and listen to somebody you know just pop off for an hour you know you you'd probably find something else better to do with your time right uh then but if you if you walk into this space that seems welcoming that seems open um you know that's that says here let's understand each other let's try to understand each other and that's going to make us both better mm-hmm. um that he he fostered that climate 
um, in, in the Oxford club. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I think I read at one point and I think I mentioned it in the book, like some nights they had 80 to hundred people. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, that's crazy. And faculty yeah. members were there, you know, to yeah. watch, um, you know, like the little meme with like Michael Jackson and the popcorn. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. like, wow. I mean, can you imagine? Like I would, I, yeah, if I had a time machine, I would love to, to go and just sneak in the back, you know, and listen, but you know, it's, um, you know, I think, and maybe you've seen this Daniel, but I felt, I feel like God hides everywhere Mm -hmm. in plain sight, uh, Mm -hmm. especially at the college. There's so many, I I can't even, I mean, there are so many great stories about my journey with this, with this dissertation, um, that just kept lining up. And I was like, this is not coincidence, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like for example, when they, when they scheduled me for everything, you know, so my proposal, uh, was scheduled in November. So they're like, what about the 29th? And I was like, okay, that's Lewis's birthday. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then when I defended, it was on Lewis's wedding anniversary. <laughs> and I and I didn't I didn't have any, you know, that was not in my, uh, you know, I, I didn't do anything with the scheduling, mm-hmm. you know. But even when uh, I was one committee member short, and uh, I, there was a another faculty member there, and I got up. I remember it was before class. I got up. She wasn't teaching the class. She was just hanging out in the. You know, I was going to ask her if she'd like to be on my committee, right? Because I needed one more person. Yeah. And some people were not that keen on wanting to be on my committee because it was about a Christian writer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, so I went and, I, you know, I, I didn't even know her. I introduced myself. And she said, oh, 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 are you the one that's doing C.S. Lewis? Uh, and, you're, and I said, yeah. And she said, well, I'd love to be on that committee if you have an open spot. Oh, <laughs> and cool. I said, yeah, yeah. I was just like. Well, yeah, that's, that's actually great. why I came over here. Like, you know, so many cool God moments, uh, you know, and there were many times, and you you probably know this too, that you get really discouraged when you're doing all that research and all that time and everything mm-hmm. in it. But, you know, every time I would turn a corner and God was like, I'm still here, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it just felt like God was all over that project. So, which is one of the reasons why I was like, well, I have to write the book, you know, because um, I honestly didn't intend to do much with it after I finished. And then, all of a sudden, like I was getting danged for people who were writing their dissertations off my dissertation and stuff. It was wow, really yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I, I was like, I was getting emails from people. And I was uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a, a doctoral committee for somebody who did um, co- like different generational leaders and transformational leadership in hmm. C.S. Lewis. And, uh, and then this last summer, they told me there was a couple more that were coming through the pipe from Dallas and other places. And I was like, that's nuts. I had no, yeah, that's <laughs> like so I, had, cool. I had no, you know, I had, it's really crazy. You just put the, you put the seat out there and God, you know, does that, but I had not, I didn't intend it to, you know, it was, it was a means to an end for me kind of at first, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, I got it. But then like it started growing and everybody's like, well, you should just go ahead and write the book. And I was like, I guess I should. Then when the <laughs> pandemic hit, I was like, Oh, well I have all this free time. Yeah. So. <laughs> may as well do something so instead yeah. of playing animal crossing for five hours or whatever <laughs> um trying to teach over zoom yeah yeah oh yeah which is horrible i, I miss i missed my students so much oh was, i know it's just not the same so yeah yeah, yeah and that, that's sort of how it came about it it sort of grew from that and um and it was there were tough points i mean writing a book is not easy it's, i, I believe it <laughs> But, you know, I kept being like, oh, you can do it. You know, I was looking at all those inspirational memes and just like hanging mm-hmm. in there. So no, nah, but it was it was it, it's awesome. Um, it's just so awesome when you kind of blink and look back and it's like, hey, man, you know, before I hit send on it, um, I just prayed that sure. God just use it, man. Use it however you want. Um, I'm just putting it out there. This is my little you know, bit of <laughs> widow's mic. <mind. laughs> this is my this is my little yeah. little contribution. You do what you want to with it, and so yeah. So it's he's he's taken over the project at this point. <laughs> so well, yeah. thanks thanks so much for sharing, Crystal. It's been really great to hear from you, to learn more about this book, to think through uh, the ways that we can learn more about leadership through C.S. Lewis. Um, if anyone is, and I'm sure many are, are interested in reading more about your book or hearing more from you, where can they find you at? Where can they purchase this book at before we let you go? Okay. So, um, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, just look up, uh, the leadership of CS Lewis. It'll pop up or, um, 
I do have an author page there too with the with the Lewis and Women book and stuff on there as well. Um, I am on social media. Um, I'm sort of on Facebook. <laughs> I, I, I I go in and out depending on how busy I am, but I'm also on uh, uh, Twitter as at Dr. Hurd, uh, D-O-C-T-O-R. H-U-R-D, um, and I'm also on Instagram at the same hashtag okay. so, or at the same handle. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I have people who reach out to me all the time on Messenger. And I, 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 got, a, I got a question yesterday about how many books were in Albert's house, you know, when C.S. Lewis mm-hmm. was a kid. And I was like, we don't know, but it was a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was thousands probably that, uh, you know, three deep. Um, so yeah, people message me all the time and ask me, I mean, I, I got asked, um, <laughs> I got asked over email a while back, like if, if, if Albert was deaf in one ear and I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, like, we don't know these be, things. You would be surprised what people sit around and think about. Like, <laughs> So you're asking our listeners to find you and ask you the weirdest questions they can think of about if Albert was still alive today, what would be his favorite Skittle? Could you please let us know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's that's great. We definitely, uh, I'm sure many of our listeners will want to find you in those places. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Daniel and Phil, it's always a pleasure hanging out with you guys. So thank you so much. It's it's a joy. Yeah. I'll go ahead and wrap this up here, and then um, we'll, we'll be back pretty soon for Chapter 4. Mm-hmm. This episode is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you too can listen to a bonus episode each month, along with other rewards. Special thanks goes to Hannah Anderson, John Marr, Emily Wakefield, and Ryan Smith for supporting us at our top tiers. If you have any listener feedback, we'd love to hear it at thenarniapodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 406-646-6733. A review on Apple Podcasts would also be appreciated. Thank you for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time with Chapter 4.